Welcome back to the CMDA Matters Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Chupp. And just as I promised you last week, we have Dr. Carl Truman back today, and he'll be discussing his new book entitled The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. At least one respected reviewer has predicted that this book will be the book of the decade, particularly on the topic of the church and culture. I'd love to send you a copy of Dr. Truman's book as a gift for listening to CMDA Matters. So later in the program, I'm going to tell you just how you can claim your copy. Dr. Carl Truman became professor of biblical and religious studies at Grove City College after completing a year as the William E. Simon Fellow in Religion and Public Life at Princeton University in 2017. It was during this year as a fellow at Princeton that Dr. Truman did much of the research and honed his opinions on the book that we'll be discussing again this week. Dr. Truman is an esteemed church historian and has authored and edited more than a dozen books, including the book, The Creedal Imperative, Luther on the Christian Life, and Histories and Fallacies. Dr. Truman is a long-term member of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Jeff Barros, our CMDA Senior Vice President for Bioethics and Public Policy, as we discuss with Dr. Truman how the modern self that he writes about represents a so-called psychological man, and how the sexual revolution became plausible not only technically because of birth control pills and abortion on demand, but because of the rise of expressive individualism. Let's listen in. Well, I want to welcome you back uh, to CMDA Matters. And our guest again this week is none other than Dr. Carl Truman, who's professor at Grove City College in Pennsylvania. And Dr. Truman, I don't know how many of our listeners out there, physicians like me, were so keen on getting to take care of patients that sped through the pre-medical years and through medical school and didn't pay a whole lot of attention to political science or history, philosophy and Christian thought. I had one course in my undergrad liberal arts school. And reading through your book, man, I was uh, exposed to Marx and Freud and Nietzsche and Locke and Rousseau. All these people, man, I may have heard of them, but I knew very little. And then to find out that they are key players. I wanted to start off this week's conversation, Dr. Truman, by you mentioned that Freud's, most of his, his models, his theories have been debunked over the decades, and yet we find him still so influential in this modern self. How does that happen that someone that most of his peers uh, say, eh, these things aren't reality, but we're going to hang on this social imaginary, it's still going to have impact? Yeah, it's an interesting question about Freud. And I think the answer is there's a sort of twofold answer to that. The, the one side of it is some of what Freud says is, is actually true and I think uh, holds water. And secondly, uh, a lot of what Freud says may not be true, but it's very appealing and we want it to be true. Uh, as to the first, uh, I think Freud's great insight is that if you want to know what a society holds dear, look at what it forbids. Look at the things that are taboo in society. And of course, much of what society has forbidden over the years has been sexual. And I, I think that's true. If you look at uh, you know, it, families that va- uh, societies that value the family have very strict rules on sexual behavior that protect the family structure. Now, what's interesting and what's perhaps disturbing on that front is the the implication of what Freud says there is that when we reach a point where less and less is being forbidden, you're actually reaching a point where society is in some way starting to crumble or fall apart. And one of the worrying things about the sexual revolution is this wholesale overthrowing of traditional sexual morality must ultimately come with a social and cultural cost because sexual taboos are central to holding society together. And I think on that front, you know, that's what I positively use Freud, if you like. I think Freud is is strong there. And I would say, you know, when you look at the Bible, look at the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments are marked by what? 
banning things, mm -hmm. telling you what you can't do, Taboo. setting limits beyond which you must not pass. And when we move into a, 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 a cultural moment as we are now, where the old taboos are being overthrown almost every week, uh, I think we are justified in thinking that we are potentially heading into a, a time of great cultural instability. The second aspect of Freud is, I think when, when he tells us that we are fundamentally sexual beings and that our happiness is to be found in sexual satisfaction, that's kind of half true. Bottom line is, for most of us, our sexual desires are a strong part of who we are. And sexual activity does bring, as Freud points out, intense happiness, intense pleasure. And, you know, nobody's ever lost money selling sex. A philosopher comes along and tells you, hey, the way for you to be really happy is for you to just let rip relative to your sexual desires and indulge them as much as you possibly can. That's a winning sales pitch. <laughs> it's a winning sales pitch, I think. So I think part of the power of Freud is, yes, we know that things like the Oedipus complex, et cetera, et cetera, the death drive, all of this stuff has now been, I think, debunked by and large. And Freud, in certainly in the psychology classes at, at Grove, as far as I can make out, Freud, you know, Freud is looked at in terms of a figure of historical interest, not a living influence on the discipline. But in terms of those basic ideas, I think they've made their way into that social imaginary we talked about last time. And they've done so because they appeal to us. In terms of the sexual revolution, what do you believe to be the cause and what set these changes that we're seeing today in motion? Yeah, the sexual revolution is interesting. And again, the, the temptation for Christians, of course, is to, to blame it on the 60s. Yeah, we tend to think of the sexual revolution as something that happened in the 60s, and therefore the 60s are to blame. Uh, and there's a lot of truth to that chronologically. The, the sexual revolution takes off in the 60s. But of course, the 60s didn't come out of nowhere. 60s were caused by the 50s, that were caused by the 40s, that were caused by the 30s, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I would say that uh, in, in Western culture, a series of key moves uh, took place that led to the sexual revolution. Uh, revolution. Some of them are intellectual. And in the book, I really focus very much on the intellectual narrative. I think what you find in the late 17th and then on into the 18th century is an authorization of psychology. What I mean by psychology is, is the inner space of feeling for human beings, that the move is made there to saying, you know, that which you are at a most fundamental level is your feelings. What you find then in the 19th century is, is that feelings are, first of all, detached from any moral framework by people like Nietzsche. Nietzsche essentially says, you know, there is no metaphysical moral structure to the universe to which we need to conform ourselves. Morality is a contract played by the weak on the strong. Your feelings are just your feelings. They, they don't have any moral quality uh, other than that. And then that's really picked up. Uh, we find a parallel in the scientific uh, narrative with a man like Freud, who says, essentially says that it's correct that we are who, who we feel we are inside. But the, the sting in the tail is those desires, those feelings are fundamentally grounded in sexual desire. They're dark. Our inner space is a dark space of sexual desire. By doing that, Freud makes a, a key philosophical mood, move in the understanding of sex. Sex moves from being an activity to being an identity. If you read the Bible, there's plenty of sex in the Bible. Some of it's considered legitimate, uh, some of it's illegitimate, but it's always an activity. What you get when with Freud is he's saying, you know, you are your desires. And as your desires are sexual desires, then you are your sexual desires. That really provides the framework for modern thinking where people identify themselves as lesbian, gay, straight, bi, trans, etc., etc. Your desires become your identity at that point. As soon as you make that move, of course, sex is going to become political because one of the central parts of, of legal codes throughout history has been the policing, the corralling, the restricting, the shaping of social sexual behavior. That's a basic element of society throughout the ages. So once you make sex identity, you make sexual codes political. 
at that point. You make sex very political. So that's one aspect of the story that sets up for the, the sexual revolution. When you look at the rhetoric, for example, of the student rebellions of 1968, there's a lot of sexual rhetoric there. The student rebellions of 1968 you know, are often about sexual liberation. The liberation of human beings is the transgressing, the overthrowing of the old sexual codes. There's also a technological revolution. And this goes to that social imaginary issue we talked about a few moments ago. Uh, in order for something to become actual, it has to be possible and it has to be plausible. And the pill, of all things, above all things, the pill, and then at a later state, easy on-demand abortion, make the sexual revolution plausible. Because there you can have sex with comparatively few social consequences which was not the case throughout much of history. You think about it, you know, if you're a, a 19th century guy, you know, you're 19, 20, uh, you, your hormones are raging, uh, you know, you, you want to have sex with a woman, well, what do you got to do? You've got to get a job, you've got to be clean, you've got to prove to her parents that you have a future. If you mess around, you'll find that her father and her brothers come after you to teach you a lesson. <laughs> Uh, you can't get away with breaking the sexual mores of your day. Come the 60s, none of those things apply. You can be a, you know, a total loser by modern standards and still you know, uh, enjoy an active sexual life because sex no longer carries the kind of consequences that it once did. So the sexual revolution is, the, uh, I, I think, the confluence of technological developments and of philosophical developments coming together in explosive form in the 1960s. Well, Dr. Truman, with all these changes that are going on with the sexual revolution, the things you've been talking about, one of the main issues I think that many of our members are facing, our students, our residents, uh, even our graduate members, are struggling with how to talk to their colleagues about their own uh, views on these things without going into or necessarily using biblical language. And I know you talk about the concept of embodiment in your book on uh, and several different ways. And, and I'd like to ask you if you feel that is a good language to be used uh, with non-believers as a way to talk about issues like abortion, transgenderism, even end-of-life issues. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, it's an interesting question and a, a, a very difficult one. Uh, I, I, I think to some extent, you know, my, my focus is very much on getting Christian people to think clearly about these things at this point. You know, I'm not confident that Christians themselves really have a sound grasp on what the Christian position on embodiment is. Uh, would be when I was pastoring for some years, an older pastor said to me, you know, do not assume that anyone under the age of 30 agrees with what you think is basic common sense about sex and embodiment. Well, that was 10 years ago. Uh, you can probably say now anybody under the age of 40 or 45, you, you can't make that assumption. So a lot of my thinking has really been done on on, on getting Christians to wake up to the intuitions of the social imaginary that they may have imbibed without even thinking about it. How to talk to those outside the church on these things, how to talk to colleagues in the medical profession. That's an, an interesting and, and difficult question. I think I would, uh, on one level, I'm looking at the book now on my bookshelf, I would recommend to any medical person that they get hold of Carter Sneed's book, What It Means to Be Human. She came out at about the same time as my own. He's a bioethicist, and he works there very much on the importance of embodiment for ethical understanding. And doesn't really use, you know, Carter is, a, I think he's a devout Catholic, but he doesn't use Christian language or theological language in that book. And he, he starts to work there from the idea of, well, whatever else we are, we are bodies, and that means that whatever else we are, we are dependent creatures. You know, Rousseau has this ridiculous statement that man is born free and everywhere is in chains. If ever a philosophical statement was, was so obviously untrue and yet has come to be so influential, uh, that has to be it. 
Yeah, man is born incredibly dependent upon his parents. And we spend our lives pretty much dependent upon other people and on other bodies because of our own embodiment. And finally, at the end of life, we sort of revert to the same kind of bodily dependency we had at the start of life. So one way I think that, that to go about this would really be to, to try to get people to think about the importance of the body. I also think pointing people to the integrity of the body. I don't know if it's still the case, but it used to be the case that you could go to government medical websites and look at the, the various health conditions uh, uh, that afflicted uh, active homosexual men because of the lifestyle in which they engaged. You know, one doesn't have to take a moral stand on those things to say, look, if, if you behave in a certain way, you're shortening your lifespan. You're doing damage to your physical body. You're making yourself incredibly vulnerable to these illnesses, this damage, which cannot possibly be part of your general thriving and flourishing. So that would be another thing that I would do. Is I don't know if those websites even exist on government uh, on government sites anymore, but I'm sure that as medics, you'd be able to get hold of the statistics for that relatively easy, easily. So I, I think a real emphasis upon the body and on the importance of the body. I do think on the transgender question, there's a sense in which it's going to be very difficult in the near future. On the transgender question, I am relatively optimistic in the long term on the grounds that because the bodies are so important they cannot be gerrymandered willy-nilly and nature will bite back tragically there will be an awful lot of human suffering that takes place between now and the point when we see the tide turning but again i think a focus on the body as you know doing these things the human body messing with hormones engaging in uh, in bodily mutilation these things are ultimately futile and very very damaging in the book uh, dr truman you point out that with expressive individualism that there's a focus on today, pleasure today, being happy today, not thinking about the future so much. So you were mentioning that it, there is a little bit of hope in, in healthcare and with the body and with medicine because we can talk about what outcomes are. With what you have mentioned that there is this temporal focus, we are brought up in, in our training, uh, I'm a surgeon, Jeff, an OBGYN, to talk about what are the best chances for outcome here. And certainly on the transgender identity issue, it seems to me that that's where those of us who are courageous enough and willing to talk about it, that's where our focus needs to be. That, I think that's what you were referring to earlier, that outcomes, that we really care about human flourishing and good outcomes, though... The definition of health and well-being, I think, has been manipulated, has it not, just a little bit in 2021? Yes, uh, and I think you know, 2021 has been, I've seen the term apocalyptic used about the COVID situation by a number of Christian theologians and using it in its technically correct sense, not in that it's a disaster, which it is, but in the sense that it is revealing. And you know, COVID has been a very revealing moment for society as a whole on the grounds that I think what's emerged has been we lack a moral hierarchy for ranking goods. I was very fortunate last year. My wife and I were very fortunate in that uh, she was uh, flagged as a potential as potentially having cancer at the start of the year. And thankfully, we were able to go through all of the procedures before everything closed down. Uh, what was interesting was she was told by her physician afterwards that if we hadn't got through the process by the time COVID became the only show in town, they would have assumed a worst case scenario and 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 done some pretty drastic surgery uh, in that case, which would actually have been completely pointless as this was a false alarm. And that really got me thinking that, wow, we're in a situation where you know, the only danger is the clear and present danger. The only good is immediate survival. The long-term effects of what we're doing relative to COVID uh, are not being taken into account in terms of, of health policy at this particular point. And none of this is to say that drastic measures weren't necessary. It's just that there didn't seem to be any discussion or thinking or nuance relative to, to the drastic measures. So I think the whole notion of 
of health seems to have become almost immediate survival slash doing things that make people feel safe rather than thinking about, well, what are the long term aggregate effects of the policies we are doing? What does this mean for long term mental health? My mum is a widow, has hardly seen anybody for the last 12 months. It's had an effect on her. How does that play into our understanding? And again, you make the point at the start, expressive individualism will tend to collapse everything into the present moment, the needs of the present moment, the reassurance of the present moment. And I think we've seen that big time uh, relative to the, the COVID crisis over the last year. Well, as we conclude this week's interview, Dr. Truman, you conclude the book, and I I will say I finished it a couple of days ago. It was a rather sobering conclusion. There were some bright spots and some not so bright spots. What hopeful things do you think readers can take away from your book after finishing this, which, I mean, to me, this is like a textbook. I would love to sit under your teaching for a whole semester on the rise and triumph of the modern self. (laughs) Well, thanks very much. For anybody who's interested in not reading the book but getting a short version, uh, Grove City College actually has eight lectures uh, of mine online that basically do a sort of sweep through the book. So you can save yourself Mm -hmm. all that reading if you want. Uh, I think, first of all, uh, you know, Hope is not a strong suit in the book. I'm really wanting to give that analytical genealogy of where we are. And we're, you know, society is in a difficult place at the moment, and the church is in a difficult place. So I want people to be sobered up about what we're facing. I also want people to realize, you know, the church is likely to be shunted to the margins, at least for the rest of my lifetime, maybe for the next few centuries. Who knows? Uh, And that's a cause for lamentation. But it's not a cause for despair. Uh, And it's not a cause for despair for two reasons. Uh, One, there's the obvious reason. We have the promises. We know how history ends. The church wins. It may not be my denomination or my congregation or my generation that witnesses that. It may not be you know, my nation that survives to see the church winning. But we know that the church wins. So in the long run, everything's going to be okay. Everything is okay. Death has already been overcome. In the more short term, though, I think that we need to avoid uh, seeing marginalization as a complete disaster. Because one of the things that history teaches us is that groups shunted to the margins form strong communities and become powerful simply by virtue of being strong communities. If you think of the Jews in medieval Europe, they were marginalized. And yet the House of Rothschild becomes one of the most powerful banking institutions in Europe. Why? Because money lending was all they were allowed to do. And they became very good at it. And they looked after each other. They became very strong precisely through their marginalization. The Quakers were marginalized in England. And in the 19th century, they became powerhouses in the Industrial Revolution because it was all they were allowed to do. The LGBTQ movement is without doubt one of the strongest political lobbies and forces around today. How has it got that way? They were a true community. They look after each other. They were organized. They were intense. They were intentional. That's what the church should be. So I think uh, if I was going to say, maybe it's not hope, but it's to say this, don't see our marginalization as a cause for despair. See it as an opportunity to regroup, rethink, and become strong again. Well, we've run out of time, and uh, I I wish we could keep talking for quite a long time to Carl Truman, uh, but it's truly been a delight. I strongly recommend uh, for each of our listeners to get your book. And where can we find those videos uh, from Grove City College that you were talking about? If you go to Grove City, www.gcc.edu, and look for, I think they're called Great Lectures from the Grove. There are, I think, a number of us who've done them, and um, they're actually forming the the basis of a short book that's coming out. It's going to be like a shorter version of the book coming out next year, which I hope will be useful for pastors, youth pastors, handing out to friends who don't want to read 400 pages, but maybe would cope with 120 pages. Well, you've taught this old surgeon some a lot of new things. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Well, I did have the opportunity to check out the lecture series that Carl mentioned on the Grove City College website. 
The simplest way to find them, since they are housed on YouTube, is to search for Great Lectures from the Grove, as he mentioned, and you'll find the eight 20 to 25 minute talks under the title, The Life of the Mind. Dr. Truman's new book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, is the first of what I hope will be many books of the month that we will offer you down the road. We sure do appreciate our listeners here at CNBA Matters. I'd like to send you this book for your donation of any amount. During the month of April, when you make any donation to CNBA through the link in the show notes, we will send you a copy of Carl Truman's new book as our way of saying thank you for listening. Just go to cmda.org slash rise and triumph, one word, rise and triumph, to claim your thank you gift today. Dr. Truman happened to mention the book in our interview today entitled, What It Means to Be Human, The Case for the Body in Public Bioethics by Dr. Carter Sneed. It just so happens that our CMDA Ethics Committee started a book club that I was invited to join and What It Means to Be Human is the first book that we are discussing together online. It makes a great companion reader to Dr. Truman's book, I think. Our discussion today also made me think of a second great book from a past CMDA Matters guest, author Mr. Abdu Murray. In his book entitled Saving Truth, Abdu provides his perspective that it isn't too late to save our culture from the lies of the deceiver. Dr. Truman's book, as well as Sneed's What It Means to Be Human and Abdu Murray's Saving Truth, are all available online in our bookstore and will be linked in our show notes today. Or you can get your copy by calling 888-230-2637 today. Well, the CMDA Virtual National Convention under the theme, Courage Through the Crisis, Stories from the Front Line, is now less than a month away. It will be April 29th through May 1st. This event will include lectures by notable speakers such as Dr. Albert Moeller, president of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. And he just happens to be my guest on CMDA Matters next week. You won't want to miss that interview. I wanted you to know that the next Christian academic physicians and scientists, a specialty section here at CMDA that we call CAPS, they're having a webinar on Thursday, April 21st at 7 p.m. Central Time. There will be two speakers, both of whom are CAPS members, Robert Hoffman, MD, Professor of Pediatrics at Nationwide Hospital in Columbus, Ohio, and Ines Bardella, MD, a Professor of Family Medicine at the University of Arkansas. They will speak in this webinar on how Christ and the Gospel has impacted their academic lives. There will be opportunities afterward for questions. If you'd like to participate in these monthly webinars, including that one on April 21st, as an academic physician and become a part of this specialty section of CMDA called the Christian Academic Physicians and Scientists Group, just email Christian Academics, all one word, Christian Academics at cmda.org. Well, you can find out more information and register for these two events as well as several others by going to our website, cmda.org slash events, or you can find links in our show notes today. CMDA is working on a new training program that will equip healthcare professionals just like you to effectively live out and share your faith in your healthcare practice right where you are. We're calling it Faith Prescriptions, and it consists of 24 videos, each of 15 to 20 minute duration on various practical topics such as spiritual interventions, praying with your patients, ethical and legal implications of sharing your faith. Another one entitled, Practicing Medicine Christianly, and several others. Within each of these videos, we plan to include two to three shorter 
video testimonies from various CMDA members like you across the country. So if you'd like an opportunity to be part of this new video series, we're happy to tell you how. You just need to email us at cda, cda at cmda.org, and we'll let you know how you can play a vital role in this upcoming series. as I bring this program this week to a close, I wanted to give you a short encouragement from John the Beloved, the apostle, during this Passion Week. He tells us in his first epistle, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Modernity and this post-Christian and increasingly secular society that we call home has brought a new confusion surrounding one's very sense of self and identity. It is wreaking havoc on our culture and particularly damaging our youth during their most vulnerable developmental stages. As healthcare professionals, some of you who are also parents, I bet you see this every day. As Christians, it grieves all of us to see the moral unraveling of our society, which is no longer under a Judeo-Christian safety net. As an organization, we at CMDA, we care deeply for those who have been deceived and live in this present darkness, which is why we work hard to bring you guests who share our faith and bring us keen insight like Dr. Truman did today. We believe that sharing God's truth about the world and culture in which we live should matter to you as a Christian in healthcare. And so it matters to CMDA, and CMDA matters. Thanks for listening today. Be sure to catch Dr. Albert Moeller, one of our national convention plenary speakers, on the podcast next week. God willing, we will see you again right here on CMDA Matters. Bye for now. This podcast has been a production of the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. The opinions expressed by guests on this podcast are not necessarily endorsed by the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. CMDA is a nonpartisan organization that does not endorse political parties or candidates for public office. The views expressed on this podcast reflect judgments regarding principles and values held by CMDA and its members and are not intended to imply endorsement of any political party or candidate.